Have you ever played the game, Would You Rather? You know this game? Yeah, I thought you were like that. Uh, it's where you pick two bad things, and you choose between them, like which one you would do. And the rule of the game is you have to choose something. You can't say, why well, wouldn't do either? You have to pick something. So it starts at a young age, something like, uh, would you rather, when you grow up, be a fireman or a cowboy? And, you know, boys will pick whatever. And then a couple years later, it'll turn into, would you rather eat lima beans or broccoli? And everybody knows the right answer is lima beans, of course. And then it, as you get older, um, and this is for guys, I don't know what girls talk about, but for boys, as you get older, everything revolves around a bodily function. So it's, would you rather um, touch a dog's privates or eat a booger? And the answer is eat a booger, of course. We've all done it. Don't deny it. Then it, it always gets sexual. And so like for a fifth grade boy, it's something like, would you rather kiss Becky or Jennifer? And you're left with a really big dilemma because Becky is the chronic vomiter. And so you're afraid if you kiss her, she'll vomit in your mouth. But Jennifer just got braces and you're not really sure about the whole braces thing. You think if you kiss her, your mouth will get stuck together forever. So you're not sure what to pick, but you have to pick someone. And then it gets twisted. And so you ask, would you rather kiss your grandma or your dog? And the right answer is kiss your... Yes. And then it gets, then it gets morbid. Um, and this is how men work, at least for the, the rest of your lives. You'll be sitting in a bar or around a campfire somewhere, start playing this game. And somebody will say, would you rather die from, and one of them is always drowning and anything else. Would you rather die from drowning, die from drowning or fall out of an airplane? And you know, you don't want to pick either. So I can't just tell this and not let you play. So I'm going to give you some would-you-rather questions. I want you to play with the person next to you, okay? So here's the first question. We'll start off easy. Would you rather read a book or find $10? Go. Tell the person next to you. Some of you are like, I am a gazelle. Give me 10 bucks. Okay, here's the next one. Turn the turn person next to you and, and answer, would you rather have to get around on all fours all the time or only make animal noises? Now, this is an easy one. It's obviously get around on all fours all the time because you would still be able to communicate. Okay, here's, here's another one. Turn the person you've been ignoring on the other side of you and say, uh, would you rather live in a nudist colony or live with the Amish? <laughs> you liars! <laughs> You're like, I'm in church, I must say Amish. You're going to hell, all of you. I can look at you and see your picture in the nudist colony right now. Oh my gosh. Okay, here's the last one. <laughs> this is my favorite one. If you Google would you rather, you can go to this website that gives you really inappropriate questions. That's where I got all these. Um, you just write that down for later. Uh, would you rather need to milk yourself or lay eggs? Can we leave now? Yes, I think we can leave. This is not the church for us. Some of you are just staring at me like I am going to make eye contact with the pastor. I am not going to think about milking myself. You can milk anything with nipples. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Bible today. Don't worry. This has a point. I am going somewhere. Bring it back. Bring it back. Today, I want to play the would you rather game. I want to ask you a would you rather question, but I need to set it up for a while. So get out of your head, Amish communities and nudist colonies, and stay with me for a little bit. Let me, let me first ask this. What if you worked at a hospital where no one ever got well? What if you were a marriage counselor and every couple that came to see you got divorced? Or what if you're on a sports team and you lost every single game? What if you're a part of a church where nobody's life ever changed? We're in this series called We Are Mosaic, and what we're doing is pausing 
to figure out what's special about this place, what has gotten us to this point, what is going to carry us into the future. And I'm really looking at this as an opportunity to tell you why you like Mosaic. And one of the reasons you love Mosaic, one thing that makes Mosaic a unique place is that we see lives changed here. And so I just wrote down a, a few of examples of lives I've seen changed. I've seen dozens of people become debt-free. I know a guy who doesn't look at porn anymore because even though he's single, his future marriage, even though he doesn't know who it's to, is more important. I know a couple, a married couple, that's not content with an okay marriage. They want a great marriage, so they went to a marriage counselor. I could list a dozen couples who've said, our, we're going to put our time and money where our mouth is. A person, I, I know a bunch of people who are taking vacation to go on mission trips. They have a trip leaving this week for the Dominican Republic. I know an alcoholic who realized freedom was better than addiction. I know a student who realized living for a purpose was better than partying. And these stories, by the way, are why our church needs to grow. On one hand, who cares if our church grows? It just makes my life more difficult. You know, that my, there's more kids in here and we have to recruit more volunteers and there's not enough parking spaces and this room is crowded. We got a good intimate feel, but we need to grow because there are more lives that need to be changed. And I've said this probably 10 times in the history of Mosaic, but as long as there is one person within the reach of this church, our job isn't done. We will purposefully and relentlessly pursue the lost. Now, some of you are sitting here thinking, Carl, I don't care why Mosaic grows or if Mosaic grows. And I get that. You're the person who was dragged here. And he said, if you come to church, I'll buy you a free lunch. Or she said, I won't date you unless you come to my church. So you're here so you can date her and go out later. And you're thinking, I don't really care what makes Mosaic special. Okay. Well, let me just ask you this question. Here's the would you rather question. Would you rather keep living your current life or see a change? Would you rather keep living your current life or see a change? Is your life what you want it to be? When you look at your job, do you have a sense of purpose there? When you think of your family, is it a safe place where forgiveness is offered and people truly know each other? When you look at your finances, are you on a trajectory of impacting people for generations with your generosity? See, if your life is exactly what you want it to be, there is nothing Mosaic has to offer you. There's nothing that Jesus has to offer you. And we see this in the Bible. Person after person come and encounter Jesus, and they say, well, I've got my family, I've got this money, or I've kept the legalistic rules all my life. And they walk away from Jesus because what he's asking of them, they don't want and they don't need. So if your life's perfect and you can just sit patiently today, and maybe come back to Mosaic one day when things aren't perfect in your life. But if you're here because something's not right, your marriage is just okay, or that addiction's hard to beat, or something's just missing, and you're not sure what it is, then I want to talk to you for a minute about why lives are changed here. And I want to give you some principles of life change. And then I want to wrap up by calling you to join the mission. So why are lives changed here? I recently finished a book by Chip and Dan Heath called Switch, How to Change Things When Change is Hard. And they boiled change down in, into a threefold action plan. They said, first, you have to appeal to people's logic, help them logically understand why and how they need to change. And then you have to appeal to people's emotion. You have to make them emotionally want to change. And then they said, maybe the most important thing is you have to shape their path. You have to give them an easy path to walk down to achieve the change you want them to have or, or that they want in their lives. And one way we try to make it easy to walk down the path towards Jesus is really a big difference in how Mosaic operates and how your old church operated or how the church you grew up in operated. Because at most churches, they work this way. You have to believe, and if you believe, then you belong. And a lot of you have experienced that because you came in and and you were just seeking truth or seeking hope, and you were told, well, you don't agree with us or or our doctrine's different or or you don't dress the right way or you've got to do this or say this or or act like this if you want to be a part of us. And at Mosaic, what we found is that people belong long before they believe. And so we make this a place where you can belong before you believe. The way they say it in the book is this way. Change is not analyze, then think, then change. Let's get that up on the screen. Change is not analyze, then think, then change. Analyze and uh, change instead is, let's get on the screen. See, then feel, then change. That's how we change. And this is why at Mosaic we push baptism. The Bible says that when you initially give your life to Christ, you repent and are baptized. You acknowledge in your heart and with your actions that you are a sinner who needs grace. 
So the most important thing at Mosaic that ever happens is someone giving their life to Christ. And when someone is baptized, it doesn't mean they won't sin ever again, or they figured it all out, or their faith is perfect and they'll never doubt ever again. Instead, it means they intend to say yes to whatever Jesus asks. They can't do life on their own. They have willfully chosen to do things on their own and walk away from God, and they need to drink need Jesus to bring them back. And it does mean that in contrast to the guy who wrote that song, they know there is nothing good in me. And I need Jesus to make me good. And this is why we go nuts during baptism. This is really the reason the only numerical goal we have as a church is that we have a hundred baptisms in a year. It's the only thing that if that doesn't ever happen, then I think we failed in some level because I think God wants us to do that. And because that's our mission, because we want to continue to reach lost and broken people, uh, I have a favor I need to ask of this crowd of second service. I'm telling first and and third service I'm asking you this, so you have to answer me when I ask this. Um, We need to make some more room in this service. Last week we were at about 95% capacity. I know last week we had eight empty seats in the service. And then two weeks ago, we actually had people sitting on the floor and watching in the lobby because we were out of room in here. And we're looking at a couple different ways uh, to make more room in here. Um, But what I am going to do is ask some of you to not come to second service anymore. The reason is we need to create open seats at optimal times. And what I'm about to ask, if you, um, on which you're serving or bringing someone who doesn't go to church, you can ignore my question. uh, Because if you're serving or bringing someone who doesn't go to church, you just come to church whenever it works out for you. But what I need to do today, like right now, is I need 25 volunteers who will commit that unless you're serving or bringing someone who doesn't go to church, you'll commit to not coming to second service anymore. That you will attend either first service or third service going forward um, because you believe in the vision of this church and you want to say, I'm willing to give up my seat so somebody else can come, so I'll either come later or stay earlier. So we're going to do this, and if you don't raise your hands, this will be very awkward. But I need 25 volunteers, and I'm going to stand here and count. Keep your hands up because I need to see them. I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 30, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Wow, you guys are awesome. Now, come on, I think they're awesome. Y'all need to clap for those people. That's great. Um, you know, I... Uh, I really appreciate that. Um, I had some jokes even set up, like to kill time in case uh, you didn't raise hands, but they weren't any good. I do need to add, though, like I just need to disappoint you on the heels of that. Um, Maybe give you some good news, those of you who just raised your hands. I forgot to mention during the offering uh, intro that we are not giving away the hoodies today, if you haven't figured that out yet. We promised to give away mosaic, awesome, comfy, as Jonathan says, feely hoodies one week during this series, and it's not today. So sorry, deal with it, moving on. Um... But if you come to first service next week, or whenever we do it, because we haven't chosen the week yet, uh, you'll get to choose your color, first dip. So just throwing that out there. Um, Ooh, ah. Okay, moving on. I want to give you some principles of life change. Um, First, I want to give you a couple of cautions about life change, because I think sometimes what may happen in the way I word things is I don't ever mean to communicate this. I'm afraid what you may hear sometimes is... um, if you give your life to Jesus, that tomorrow everything's going to be okay? Like, you, you give your life to Jesus, tomorrow your finances are all going to be great, and, and you'll have hope, and you'll have purpose, and just, you'll smile all the time. And that's not uh, necessarily how it works. Sometimes our lives aren't changed how we want. See, the way God works often is the relationship may not be healed. God may just give you the grace and strength to get through it. And God may not remove that temptation for your, from your life that you keep falling to. He just may teach you that his grace is never failing. And God may not change the circumstances that are driving you crazy, but he may instead change your heart. And sometimes change takes a long time. And when change takes a long time, uh, if we're up close, if we're in it, we may not see the change. We may not notice it. An example I was thinking of just yesterday is my wife was showing me a picture from Facebook or Instagram or something of our nephew and um, he was going to his first homecoming last night. So he's all dressed up, his bow tie on and smiling, you know, picture on Facebook or whatever. And I was looking at it thinking, man, what happened to the five-year-old that I would shoot hoops with? 
you know, he's grown up and he's in the middle of puberty right now. And his parents don't see that because they're around him every single day. He doesn't notice it because he's the one going through it. But when I see him at Thanksgiving or Christmas or whatever, I'm going to think, man, you have changed drastically since the last time I saw you. And in following Christ, it's very rare that you start following Christ and boom, something happens tomorrow where your life is drastically different. But as you look back, 1, 5, 10, even 20, 30, 40 years, you'll say, man, here's what my life used to be, but here's what it is now. And we can't get discouraged in the short term. So here's what I want to do. I want to kind of explain something that some of you have talked about um, and just kind of you, you've talked about it in different ways. And, and what it is, is, is maybe you haven't used this word with me, um, but, but I kind of hear a buzz around, around Mosaic that our church has momentum right now. And so I want to just kind of explain why our church has momentum and it relates to what we're talking about today. So, so the, the formula for momentum, if momentum is P, then momentum is mass times velocity. I know some of you are thinking, Carl, three weeks ago you trashed algebra and said we never needed it. Now you're teaching us physics. Shut up. Um, <laughs> velocity is speed plus direction. I was